Hi everybody. So I had a few comments or at least one comment asking me to explain a little bit more about how I would come up with the kind of improvisation I came up with a few weeks ago when I posted that little spring chacon in D. Um, and uh, I certainly don't regard myself as being any kind of an expert in Baroque or classical improvisation. I'm kind of learning it as I go along. Um, I enjoy it a lot. So um, <laughs> hopefully you'll find some of the things that I sort of talk about here to be helpful in your own improvisations, perhaps not just in Baroque music, but maybe in jazz as well. Um, so uh, the first thing is the form of the piece I was playing. It's a chacon. Um, chacons in common with uh, quite a few different types of Baroque um, piece uh, or dance uh, music has a very repetitious bass line. Um, most chacons basically have a, a bass line of, of a few bars of length that repeats over and over again. Um, and this they have in common with things like passagalias. Often the two terms are used independently or like interchangeably. Um, and uh, more generally, those things are sort of referred to as a ground bass. But, uh, you know, ground bass can be quite a long thing. So, for instance, in the Goldberg variations, it's a long ground bass. Whereas in this case, um, this bass line is very similar to the first few bars of the Goldberg variations, albeit in a different key. But um, I don't go in all the sort of various directions with it that Bach does. And then, um, obviously, um, it allows him to write a longer uh, piece of music. Um, but this is just short, and I'm just getting started. So um, hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have an idea of how to um, go about improvising or at least constructing some kind of a piece on this idea. So the bass line itself is very simple. We're in key of D. So the, it's really consisting of two sections. The first section is a, what, what they call a, a tetrachord, which is four notes going down, right, basically. So going down stepwise in a scale in the key of D, it would be D, C sharp, B, a. So walking down to what you might call the dominant or five of the key, okay? And then the next bit, we go into what might be called a cadence, right? Which means we're going back to chord one. And to do this, we start off on the third degree of the key, which is F sharp. And then we go to four, four, five, one. So three, four, five, one, which reminds me of um, weather report for some reason. Okay, so... Um, uh, yeah, so um, obviously, hopefully that's nothing crazy and out there. You know, we've all come across these movements before in music. Um, the Beatles were quite fond of this one. You know, Oasis even. And of course, you know, 4-5-1 is a familiar movement from uh, uh, all kinds of music. Where this differs a little bit, perhaps, from the kind of jazz improvisation where you have a set chord progression, like a 12-bar blues, for instance, is that the bass line can support quite a few different harmonies and melodies, depending on how you go about it. So um, I'm going to try and avoid talking too much in the language of figured bass for this video. It's difficult. Um, if you want to learn more about figured bass and some of the basic concepts I'm talking about, please check out the video that I did on figured bass. Um, it, it explains the basic concepts hopefully clearly, so you can understand them. But really, um, the upshot figure bass, which is basically a form of harmony where you have numbers which indicate the intervals or chords to be put on the bass line, um, has taught me to, I think, understand harmony in a much more counterpoint-oriented way, okay, in terms of intervals rather than in terms of, you know, uh, one, four, five, and so on, you know, like functional Roman numeral chords. And that's quite interesting. Um, I think it has a knock-on effect for things like um, jazz, um, like Barry Harris system, for instance, but um, I'm getting ahead of myself, right? So um, uh, probably uh, let's start off with a simple two voice thing. And this is kind of what I do at the beginning. I kind of just really take um, just a, a tenth. So a tenth, if you don't know, is when you go up the scale. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like that. It's like a third, but up an octave. Tenths are brilliant, by the way. You can play things like this with them. You know, uh, Thelonious Monk absolutely loved them. Pianists generally love them, um, although they're hard to play. You know, on the guitar, they're relatively easy, and you have pieces like Blackbird, which rely on them, and they fill up a lot of space, even though they're very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just two notes. And tenths also form the basis of things like our well-known kind of drop two chord shapes and so on. 
So the tenth is one of the most useful intervals on the guitar, whether you're playing baroque music or jazz or whatever, really. So if you listen to my melody, it's basically. Okay. It's just tenths, right? So I can play um, uh, a little a little ornamentation, which, which I do at the beginning. So I go. I do that. I go. So we're just doing a, a little da da da. I don't know what you call that. Um, I always get confused with cl cl uh, classical ornaments. Is it a mordant? I don't know. Somebody will write it in below. It's where you just go to the scale step below and you come back up again. So that's basically my opening, my opening gambit, if you like, and that's all just based on tenths. And then I play um, uh, the cadence bit, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay. So um, that's uh, very straightforward. Now um, I actually play a three voice texture. So when you start playing in three voices, you've got to self ask yourself questions about, okay, um, what other note am I going to add in? Obviously, um, if I just add in a fifth, then you get really very um, uh, to classical ears, unattractive voice leading, especially that one you get what's known as parallel fifths so they don't really like that for the style I mean it might be good for rock music but for this kind of 18th century sort of style it's not quite right um, so you could uh, use what's known as six three chords instead so we're adding an interval of a sixth to our to our um, uh, to our third to our tenth which means that we end up with um, kind of like first inversion chords um, and this is best done uh, that wants to be stable, so we're going to keep that as a straight D major chord. Yeah, and then we're going to do it for this one. Okay, and then we're going to do it for this one. Ah, but here we have the same problem. That parallel fifth. So what we do is you do a chromatic alteration. We raise that G up to a G sharp, which sounds lovely, but also leads us very beautifully into an A 5-3 chord or an A triad, right? So it's just straightforward A major on the string here. These are all open voiced um, triads, basically. That sounds nice. So this is what actually gets called the rule of the octave, right? It's very, very simple way of harmonizing a descending bass like that. Uh, but we have the melody is a third each time in much the same way as you know for instance all the things you are the melody is a third above the bass line okay so that'll do for us uh, for our first little thing and then for the next bit we want some chords to go with this part of the bass line so it goes D F sharp G A B okay so um, D for the uh, D over an F sharp you know there. So this is known as 6-3 chord, first inversion chords are called 6-3 chords in figured bass. Standard, you know, G major. Okay, and then uh, what are we going to do? Sorry, it's this one. It's uh, A major, of course. So nothing fancy there. I mean, these are all cowboy chords, right? So, and then we go, um, uh, and you'll see, bass line is kind of the most important thing here remember okay so this cadence is fine there's a couple of ways we can embellish it let's talk about the a major chord this thing a53 to use figure bass notation right um, and there's a few common ways to embellish it one of the most common ways is to use what's known as a 6-4 chord but for us it's basically you know a D over an A D, D chord over an A and then we go to A sus4, A major. Now I'm very keen to get the smooth voice leading between these chords, right? Which is why I'm using this version of D major. Because I don't want to, I want to avoid using too much parallel motion. So if I use parallel motion, you get nasty consecutives. And plus, the melody jumps around too much and it doesn't sound good. So for instance, if I'm playing this, you know, this version of it. that or this 
And if I'm playing it down here, and then just to keep the chords connected by steps, right? This is obviously the same as you would if you were comping um, a jazz chord progression, for instance. Okay, so think about the melody, but also that probably helps with the rest of the uh, the harmony as well. So again, just to recap, we're using that six four chord, which is in this case a D with an A in the bass, and then A sus four, A major, and then going to D major with the D on top there, right? So the whole thing kind of looks like this. Oops, sorry. The A there. And then we do this. It's not exactly what I played, but you know, it's close enough. Okay, now, ah, ah that's a point. I, I want to get from this nice. D slash F sharp chord or F sharp six three. I want to get down to a, a G major or a G five three. But there's a little stepwise. Do I use C sharp or C? C sharp's in the key, but I tell you what, C sounds really nice. A bit better now. And so I did something uh, I used a suspension, so it's like uh, uh, going from so to so the D7 there, C. So you can put the C on the D, maybe. G sus4 to G, and then. simple but you can hear how that kind of brings those chord to chords to life a bit okay so um, in general my melody I think um, I, I do move around I play a few scales and things as well just to embellish it so perhaps if I'm linking or I might just play that as a little a little diminution a little to lead us in or you could go something like this There's all kinds of rules, by the way, with cadences. Like, for instance, that's considered imperfect because the top note is a um, is an F sharp, it's a third rather than the D. So this cadence is considered like more of a final cadence than this one, which I think you can hear. And that's something else to say there, even though it's kind of come back to the first chord. So when you're inventing melodies for your chord progressions, you might want to think about that kind of thing, for instance. Um, here's another variation. Uh, so we've taken the first part, the tetrachord, if you like, of the of the chaconne. This bass line, by the way, is the same um, as the first few bars of Bach's Goldberg variations, but also um, the same bass line in exactly the same key as used by the uh, com lute composer David Kellner for a chaconne he wrote, which is um, sort of fairly easy, straight intermediate classical guitar piece, if you want to check it out. Um, his variations are lovely. Um, he does a few different things to me. Um, uh, so definitely check that out. Um, okay, so um, tenths still. I think tenths are really nice. I just love tenths. I mean, what's not to love about that? So, uh, it's a really simple way of playing that. You know, just just that, that's nice in itself, right? But we can add an extra voice in again and again, thinking about you know the fact that if we have these. Put that as a you know regular triad, a five three chord, and then if we go six three here, we still have that problem of, of the um, you know of this parallel fifth going on, you know between that. You can hear it, right? It's ugly. I mean, for the style of music, it's not it's not idiomatic. Let me put it that way. And then, uh, but let's go to the um, 
Let's go to the A as well. Okay, again, we've got that, you know, that going on, haven't we? Yeah. So one way we can get rid of that is by playing what we call a seven to six suspension. So this simply means that one of the notes gets left behind. So, so uh, let me find the chord again. That's the one. And then we go into the next chord, but instead of moving that right down to that note right away, we kind of keep it there. So we get this, um, you might recognize that as a B minor seven shell voicing. And in classical uh, figured bass notation, that'd be written as um, uh, properly as a seven. There's no fifth in A, but fifth in A if you want, but that's, that, that's, that's a whole other can of worms. So you're going to keep it to keep it at three voices, right? Lovely. And then we can do that six resolution. Do the same thing here. Same thing, going from seven to six. Yeah. So anybody who's spent any time playing things like, you know, Freddie, Freddie Green rhythm guitar parts already knows the seven to six. Um, suspension. It's called a suspension because you're basically taking a note that's in the last chord and kind of carrying it over into the next one. Like that. So it's kind of, you know, instead of going all down together, one's going, eh, the other one's going, eh, eh, eh. so they're moving at different times, basically. I don't think that's very clear. Um, so I use that as a, as a variation. Um, and I think that sounds really nice. Um, another variation I use, um, usually the cadence is the same kind of thing, although I might hang a little bit more on the sixth four chord. But yeah, and then probably first chord would be a D going up to a D6, like that, that sounds really lovely. And then the seventh chord there, Again, a, a suspension creates this D major seven over F sharp sound going up to D, and then beautiful chords, right? And then and then we can do a suspension here as well. So we're starting to have more and more like. Um, uh, a beautiful kind of harmony just around a sort of simple thing which kind of creates more tension and more intrigue and kind of more of a story to it um notice how we're using different notes from the key and, and related keys for instance we're using c sharp in the key of d of course but then we're also using uh g sharp in this in this chord here to get into d to get to a sorry and then we're using um the c natural to get to g So um, you're kind of using the mixed Lydian and Lydian modes as well, if you like, or in uh, 18th century terms, they would call that the hard and soft hexachords. I mean, don't ask, <laughs> but you can hear how we're kind of using sort of near keys. And I suppose in modern functional harmony, that would be considered to be like secondary dominance and dominance and the dominance and things like that. Um, but we're not really thinking about any of that here. We're just thinking about making nice sounds in the intervals, right? Um, Last thing I wanted to talk about is a beautiful variation which I basically cribbed off um, uh, Sylvius Leopold Weiss, famous lute composer, um, contemporary of J.S. Bach's. Uh, Weiss wrote this lovely Passacaglia and I just nicked some chords from it. It's a similar sort of piece, not quite the same bass line, but it's the same key um, and it's a beautiful set of variations. So again, check that out if you want to see how a master would approach composing a piece like this. Um, and I'm pretty sure that it was based on improvisations that you would probably have done without really thinking at all. Okay, so um, this one is um, uh, very similar to our, you know, this 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 basically the rule of the octave is what we've been using. So this was known as the rule of the octave, this thing. Okay, so um, now uh, I'll talk about the rule of the octave in the video that I mentioned earlier. I'll pop another link up to it. Um, so uh, you can do that, of course, but then you can also incorporate some more kind of chords if you want. And one of my favorite chords to use on D, after a simple D triad, is what's called a D 
um, six sharp four two and a sharp four indicates that we're raising the fourth so the intervals are as you might imagine two sharp four and six it's this the Pat Matheny chord right or a second chord of is it Joni Mitchell's um, uh, it's a song on Court and Spark that uses it um, just like this train yeah always creates a beautiful sense of lift right I love it and then resolves beautifully to that 6-3 chord on C-sharp, which, by the way, is a first inversion A major. If, you, if, you, if you've got to think about inversions, best not to think about them. And then the next chord will be a diatonic 6-4-2. So, by the way, you may notice that this chord is a third inversion dominant seventh, right? Uh, this chord is like a third inversion major seventh. But really, you know, you can just think about diatonic intervals. Two, four, six. And again, it has quality of like being a bit suspended. One of the most beautiful things about classical harmony for me is the way you can take like um you know chords and, and leave bits behind and then catch up you know uh sort of this kind of thing <laughs> it's so great i love it Yay. i mean what I don't think we think of playing that chord in jazz. That's an A7 over a D bass. And of course, you know, the, the guy for that is Bach. You know, if you just look at his, uh, it, it turns into number wang very quickly with his, uh, with his continuo charts. But, <laughs> you know, it's always like these beautiful agonizing resolutions that, you know, are just increase the beauty of those final chords. Um, uh, his continuo parts tend to look pretty complicated. Um, I hope you find that interesting. Um, this is something that I'm going to be doing a lot of videos on, and I'll probably get zilch views, but you know, I'm going to do it anyway because it's something that interests me. I hope you find that helpful, and uh, let me know any comments or questions you might have below, as always. Thanks for watching. <laughs>